Hello, and welcome to another Thought Leaders Lecture offered by Space Center Houston and sponsored by UTMB Health. Tonight, we learn about Space Center Houston's spacesuit collection, the evolution of suits for space exploration, and the special care of this treasured collection. I'm Kelly Caldwell, archivist for Truman G. Blocker Jr. History of Medicine Collections, housed at UTMB's Moody Medical Library in Galveston. With over 30,000 pieces, the Blocker Collections is among the largest and most significant assembly of historical medical and bioscience material in the nation. Among its rare books, manuscripts, university archives, photos, and artifacts are materials documenting the early days of space travel, important resources not only for historians, but also for medical practitioners and biomedical researchers around the globe. As custodians of history ourselves, UTMB truly appreciates the importance, significance, and scientific value of Space Center Houston's comprehensive spacesuit collection. Spacesuits have made space travel possible. Space Center Houston has cultivated and preserved the legacy of that technology. Let's hear more about the journey. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining Space Center Houston's Thought Leader Series program presented by the University of Texas Medical Branch, highlighting our spacesuit collection here at Space Center Houston. I'm William Harris, President and CEO of Space Center Houston. We're a space exploration learning destination dedicated to bringing people and space closer together. As space enthusiasts, we are passionate about expanding knowledge and access to space exploration learning and training. We have the privilege of serving as the official visitor center for NASA Johnson Space Center. We share the story of human space exploration, past, present, and future. Our Thought Leader series brings you space and science experts from across the country who provide insights and perspectives on space exploration, a truly unique educational opportunity. Throughout history, humans have aspired to explore space. To make space exploration possible, we need very special equipment protect our bodies from a harsh foreign environment. It's interesting to note that the very first spacesuits were inspired by diving suits as well as high altitude flight suits. We're delighted to share with you details about our spacesuit collection and how spacesuits have evolved throughout the years. I'm excited to get our conversation underway and first we're gonna hear from Paul Spana who's going to share with us information about the STS ejection suit and later the Pete Conrad suit and the RX-5 prototype. Paul, let's talk about the STS ejection suit that we have here. I understand this was worn by John Young and it looks very different from other kind of uh, ejection suits that we've seen. So tell us a little bit about the suit and what makes it so extraordinary. I'll tell you a little bit about the shuttle first. When spacecraft are designed, they're always launched into space on test flights without people on board, except for the shuttle. When John Young and Bob Crippen, and this is John Young's suit, went on the first shuttle launch, that was the first time a shuttle was launched. It was a test flight, and that was unheard of. NASA wanted to be extra careful on that flight, so they were going to use a different type of suit. And what we're looking at here is an ejection suit. It's amazing to me that NASA was sending up astronauts on a vehicle for the very first time that there wasn't a, a test flight without astronauts in the space shuttle vehicle. And so what were some of the precautions that they took to prepare for that, for the astronaut safety? One of the precautions that they took was using an ejection seat. Ejection seats were used on the Gemini capsule, but not really on any of the other capsules or other spacecraft. So in order to use that ejection seat, NASA had to use an ejection suit as well. And this suit is designed to go along with that seat. NASA had ordered a lot of uh, ejection suits from, from the Air Force, and they weren't ready on time. So when it was time for that first launch, NASA had to borrow some of the suits from the Air Force. The Air Force had these at the time because they were using them to fly with the SR-71 and the U-2 spy plane. So what we're looking at here is John Young's suit, and it's an Air Force uh, suit because those planes that I mentioned fly up to the very edge of, of space. So the planes fly to the edge of the atmosphere, and so you have a lot less pressure. You had to have a pressurized suit. So what makes this a pressurized ejection suit? What's different about it from wearing, say, a regular jumpsuit? 
as astronauts or pilots go very high in the atmosphere, there's always that chance that they might lose pressure if something were to go wrong. So they would need to be able to build up their own pressure on the inside. That's the difference between a normal flight suit and a, a pressure suit. I also think of this as a survival suit. So it has a lot of features that help ensure the survivability of an astronaut or a, or a pilot. This suit, unlike a flight suit, also has uh, things like a built-in life raft, has a parachute, it has a radio, it has a, a lot of gear that's needed for astronauts or pilots if they get separated for their vehicle and they need to be rescued. That is amazing to think all of that is built into this suit. And I understand as well, the legs are really kind of bulky, and why is that? I think in general that spacesuits all look bulky, and that, just like this suit does, and the reason behind that is there's so many undergarments and uh, lots of layers of the, of the suit itself. The first thing that an astronaut would put on is like long johns or long underwear. That's really to make the rest of the suit more comfortable to wear. Over that is a pressure garment. It's a pressure bladder. And that's the part, think of that as like a, a balloon that's covering your whole body from your toes all the way up to your neck. That is what's going to provide you pressure in the, in the event that you may need pressure. That is but, absolutely amazing. So what are some of these pockets? What are stored oh, in some of the areas here? And it looks like there are some valves here on the, uh, for things to go in and out. That's one of the things that contributes to making the suit look bulky are, are the, uh, uh, the pockets that are on the outside of the suit. So there are other garments underneath. And then the outer garment, which is what we're looking at here, is designed to protect that pressure bladder on the inside. And it needs to be kind of loose. And the pockets are big and bulky. I think all those things contribute to making the, the suit look bulky. Some of the items that would be in those pockets are the astronauts' personal items that they want to take into space. There's also some more survival equipment in there, such as pocket knives and signaling mirrors. Um, on the left leg, one thing that makes that side look exceptionally bulky is that's where the urine collection device is. So the astronauts or pilots are in, are in their vehicle for a long time and they're going to have to go to the bathroom, but they can't go anywhere because they're strapped in there very tightly. So that's something that contributes to the bulkiness. Also on the right leg, on the thigh, that pocket looks really big because there's a, uh, a black hose that's stored in there that attaches the suit to the vehicle and to help inflate and deflate the suit as necessary. Well, this suit looks like it's been well used. Uh, it appears the shoulders are kind of worn out and then um, it also has spurs on the back. I know we're in Texas, but um, why would there be spurs on the heels of this? And the suit is, is so worn. Why is that? Well, here we like everything to look as nice as possible, but sometimes when you see something like a torn fabric or scuffed up boots, uh, there's a story behind that. And what that tells me is that this suit would, was used a lot by John Young. Um, the top of the suit there are, has torn fabric. The outer garment is a light canvas type material called Nomex. Um, and it's obviously torn. And what that tells me is that John Young used this a lot in training and preparation for his flight. So a good thing about that is, it, uh, especially in the right hand shoulder, is it gives you a, a chance to peek inside and see some of the other layers that I, I mentioned. So what would that wear come from on the shoulders? The reason for that wear is when the astronauts are strapped into an ejection seat, there's a strap that comes over each shoulder and those straps are cinched down super tight. Um, it's just like you're putting on a seat belt in your car. You want to be tight in, uh, in your seat. But it's extra important to be super tight in your, in your ejection seat because if something were to go wrong, and luckily nothing ever went wrong with NASA's early shuttle missions, you and that seat are coming out of the shuttle and you may be going hundreds of miles an hour. So you want your arms and legs to be close to your body within that seat which is the reason why there's spurs on the back of the boots. So the spurs on the back of, what function do the spurs fulfill? The function of the spurs is to help keep the feet where they're supposed to be uh, in the event of an ejection out of the spacecraft. So picture this, when the astronaut is climbing into their seat, they stand up in the cockpit and they 
there's two balls that are on the floor of the cockpit with, with metal cables on them. The spurs capture those balls and connect to them, and then the astronaut sits down. The astronaut can still move his feet back and forth without any problem. But in the event that they have to eject, when the ejection seat launches out of the spacecraft, those cables and those balls pull back and jerk the pilot's heels back snug against the seat. That is absolutely fascinating. And so, do we have an ejection seat at Space Center Houston? We actually have an ejection seat. Not only that, it was flown on one of the missions. So NASA used the ejection seats on the first four missions, STS-1 through STS-4. John Young's suit here was, was flown on the STS-1 mission. After those first four missions, NASA decided that it was no longer necessary to have an ejection seat used. And so they then wore just regular flight seats after that. However, NASA did not take the ejection seats out of the spacecraft right away. So the ejection seats actually were still inside of the shuttles all the way through SCS-61. And the ejection seat that's on display here flew on Columbia in STS-9. That is absolutely fascinating. Well, thank you for telling us about this injection suit. So, you know, here at Space Center Houston, you can see the suit. You can actually see the seat as well that goes with it. And in fact, we have Independence, uh, which is a prototype of the shuttle carrier aircraft where you can go into the pilot's cockpit and actually sit in those seats and get a sense of what it would be like to be a pilot on a space shuttle. Can't wait to hear about our next spacesuit. Thank you, William. Next, I would like to introduce the collection specialist for Space Center Houston, Carmina Motillado. Carmina has more than 25 years of museum experience, and as the collection specialist for Space Center Houston, she writes and develops content to tell the story of human space exploration. Carmina researches and implements museum industry best practices in support of creating innovative, authentic learning experiences for people of all ages. She works closely with NASA Johnson Space Center engineers, scientists, historians, administrators, artists, and other space exploration experts. As the center's artifact collections grow, Mortiato is increasingly involved in applying conservation strategies to artifact displays and handling. Her extensive museum experience includes the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum. Welcome, Carmina. I'm so excited to have you here today. I know. I'm so glad to be here talking about our suits. It's one of the things I love most about working here at Space Center Houston. Well, I'm really excited. We have two different spacesuits here, and it's obvious that they are different colors. And so I'm curious, can you tell us a little bit about each of these suits and why they're different colors? Yes, let's start with this pressure suit. This would have been worn inside the, the shuttle orbiter. And it was worn after STS-4, uh, which were the first four missions of the shuttle, which were test flights. So after the shuttle was deemed operational, they started wearing this blue jumpsuit uh, that is a jumpsuit and it wasn't, it wasn't pressurized. The helmet did have oxygen feeding to it, um, but it came from the vehicle, it came from the shuttle. Um, it was the... Um, the first four missions, which were test flights, were seen as so successful, and they were, that it was deemed safe for the astronauts to wear a non-pressurized suit. Even though it's a non-pressurized suit, it looks like there's some kind of a bladder or pump on the stomach. What is that for? So what you can see around the torso is a vest that would have uh, devices or any equipment they might need for survival, including a life raft and a parachute. Um, if you look at the suit from the back, when you visit Space Center Houston, you're able to see it, a part of the back. It looks like it has a padding, uh, like a, a chair padding on the back. That's actually uh, the connection to the parachute. You know what's so fascinating is this really was part of the democratization of space, that everyone could go into space wearing this kind of suit. And in fact, it was worn by the first women and people of color who became astronauts. Uh, so I wanted to share that with all of our, our viewers today. So very prominent astronauts like Sally Ride and Guy Buford in 1983 flew in this type of suit. So it has a really important historic significance. Yes, I'm so glad you brought that up. That's one of the historic aspects of the shuttle program is that after the success of the Apollo program, space um, flights became more routine and um, the astronaut corps opened up to not just military pilots, but um, women, people of color, and people from diverse backgrounds. 
that would bring in their scientific and engineering background into space exploration. And so it led in 1983 to the first black astronaut, uh, Guy Bluford, and uh, the first woman, Sally Ride. They actually wore this type of suit when they went into space for the first time. Absolutely fascinating. Well, it's interesting we have it exhibited here next to the orange spacesuit, or pop, more properly known as the pumpkin suit. And I guess that made it uh, more appealing to the public. They kind of understood what it was. But can you tell us a little bit about the differences between the two suit and what the significance was going from the pumpkin suit to the blue suit? Yes, so the, the blue suit was, it was basically astronaut uh, NASA wear. Everybody got the same, the same outfit, the same clothes. It was sort of no matter what size you were, you, you got the same shorts, the same pants. It was again like this routine space flight. Unfortunately, after the Challenger tragedy, NASA wanted to improve the safety aspects of the suit. And so astronauts started wearing this orange um, launch and entry suit that astronauts wore for launch and entry, which are the most dangerous parts of space flight. It is orange because uh, it's, it's an international safety orange, and that color would be visible against the blackness of space or the sky, in a jungle, or in the ocean, and so basically it eases rescue efforts if needed. I understand from when we acquired this suit that you found sand inside of it. Tell us a little bit about that. Why would there be sand inside of the suit? Yes, that's another thing. That's one of the things that I love about working at Space Center Houston is our artifacts actually come from NASA, right? They were used in training. They were used in flight. This suit uh, was actually used in training. Uh, for rescue training in the surf right here in Galveston. And so when Paul, the um, exhibits and collections director, and I were working on putting a new mannequin in the suit, we found it very difficult and we looked in there and we, we found that it was because there was a lot of sandy and very uh, salty residue left in there. Um, and so we cleaned it as best as we can for preservation uh, purposes. But it's just one of those things, it's like we're touching space exploration, you know, as, as we do our work. It's so exciting to be able to bring that to the public. Oh, that is fantastic. Well, thank you so much about telling us about these suits, Carmina. Is there anything else that you'd like to share that you think our public would be interested in knowing about? Yes, I think um, one of the things that is very unique about the launch and entry suit, the LES suit that we have on display here at Space Center Houston, is this valve on the right side of the suit. It is, uh, it's such an innovative design and um, such an important part of the suit that nationally, NASA usually removes those for suits that are gonna be on display. Uh, but for Space Center Houston, we got very lucky, and ours is an actual valve that is used. And again, as our role in the community of space exploration, sometimes engineers and suit designers for the future suits of Artemis have come to take a look at this valve to see exactly how it works. It's so um, exciting to be able to preserve that for future generations. Well, I think what's so important to acknowledge is that we build on our experience. And so we have kind of the whole chronology of suits here, and you can see how they've evolved and developed. And even planners in the future who are creating new spacesuits actually come here to learn. Exactly, yes. And you can see aspects of that pressure suit in future suits for the Artemis program. I'm really excited we're now going to talk about one of our most extraordinary suits here at Space Center Houston. This is one that was worn by the third man on the moon, Pete Conrad. He actually walked on the moon in this suit. So Paul Spano is with us to tell us more about this extraordinary spacewalking suit. William, I think it's worth repeating again. This suit was actually on the moon and I, I think that's so cool. Working here at Space Center Houston, I, I think a lot of times I'm too close to things. But I, I stopped myself to, uh, to look at suits like this and, and think of how precious these are. This suit actually walked on the moon, which is, which is awesome. So Paul, um, what is unique about having a space walking suit? How is it different from the pressure suits that we talked about earlier? The pressure suits that we talked about earlier were worn as uh, like survival suits inside of a spacecraft. Now we're looking at a suit which was made to be outside of the spacecraft for spacewalks, 
and for uh, lunar walks. This is a A7L model spacesuit, and it's to protect the astronaut when they're on the outside of the vehicle um, on that EVA, extravehicular activity. So what's unique about it is this suit has a number of different layers. One of the layers, uh, or I should say layers of garments, one of the layers of garments on the inside is a uh, cooling suit. This suit uh, regulates the temperature of the astronaut because when an astronaut is out in space or on the moon, the temperature swing can be from negative 250 degrees Fahrenheit to 350 degrees just by going from light to shadow. So the suit's got to keep up with that. Um, just wearing the suit itself is, is going to make the astronaut hot on the inside. So to help control that, there's a garment on the inside that is a liquid cooled garment. And it has, uh, it looks like a netted material, lots of tubes that run through it. So it sounds like it's an insulated long johns. Is that one way the public uh, can think about it? It is, it's long johns that keep you warm, but yet they also keep you cold when you need it. And that, that's on, on the interior of the suit. So the suit's providing protection from temperature, from radiation. Um, it, like the suits we talked about earlier, it is a full pressure suit. So the inside of it is blown up to simulate a pressure similar to that on Earth to keep the astronauts safe. Well, this must be really heavy. How much does a suit like this weigh? This suit, uh, without the backpack, probably weighs about uh, a little over 100 pounds. And with the backpack? Uh, with the backpack, I don't remember, but add another 40, 50 pounds, I guess, to that. But to the astronaut on the moon, that's not going to matter because they're only going to feel one-sixth of that because the moon only has one-sixth of gravity. Mm, very interesting. Well, looking at this suit, it looks like it's soiled, like there's something on it. What is that? On um, Why did the suit get dirty? The suit's dirty because that, what we're looking at is moon dust. Um, regolith on the moon that's lunar soil and it is it's filthy dirty and that's what's really cool about the suit is when you look at you stop and you look at a lot of the details on it you see a lot of abrasions there's a lot of wear and tear and then it's filthy dirty and that's from the the lunar dust and lunar dust is very fine like a, like a talcum powder and it's highly abrasive so um, it's not soft it's jagged and very very small and that gets into the fabric of the suit and stays there. That's what gives it this gray, uh, gray appearance. On Apollo 11, the astronauts came back. Astronaut NASA was very excited and they cleaned the suits. But uh, they learned from that mistake not to do that anymore. So this is the way it came back from, from the moon. And speaking of that lunar dust, that is going to be one of the challenges of the astronauts when they go back. Because it's so fine, it gets into a lot of the crevices, into the zippers, and the locking rings of, of the gloves and the helmet. And because it's so abrasive, when it's inside and it's moving around inside of a, uh, say, a locking ring, the cuff of a glove, NASA learned that it would start to destroy that metal. Um, there was a, a long, like a piano hinge on one of the instruments on the lunar rover and just after three days that hinge started to uh, fail because of the dust. So NASA's aware of that and they're planning for that when we return to the moon. I remember learning when we had the Destination Moon exhibit here with Apollo 11 that uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin had brought so much regolith inside of the capsule uh, that they had to, uh, when Buzz went to flip the switch to take off to mate with the capsule and Mike Collins um, the switch broke off and he used a pen to jam into the control panel and lift it up so that they could lift off of the surface of the moon. That's amazing to think about that with all the training that they went through for that first landing. Uh, getting off the moon came down to uh, using their pen to help them launch. Absolutely incredible. Well, thank you for telling us about this suit. Is there anything else you'd like to share about this suit? I get a lot of questions uh, just real quickly about the, the blue and red objects that are on front of the suit. Those are all the connections on the top left. We have a connection for electrical power. Um, on the, there's a connection for water. I mentioned about the cooling suit. That water is going into the backpack or what's called the PLIS, the uh, primary life support system. So water's flowing through there. Um, blue generally indicates that things are coming into it. So the two blue ones in the center are for oxygen that is coming into the suit. 
one from the backpack. The other one can, um, can be hooked up to the inside of the vehicle when they're inside. The two red ones are for things that are exiting out of it. One's a purge valve. Um, the other is the carbon dioxide or the, the breath that the astronaut's exhaling is going out because you don't want carbon dioxide to build up inside the suit. So that has to come out. It goes to the PLIS, the life support system on the back, and then that is uh, scrubbed out of it. So this, there's a filter that takes the carbon dioxide out of the, out of the air so the astronauts can, uh, won't get poisoned by that gas. So essentially, this moonwalking suit is a complete spaceship on your body because it's enabling you to stay alive while you're doing activity on the surface of the moon. That is a great way to think of uh, all of the spacesuits that are used for spacewalks and, and moonwalks, they are mini spacecraft and they're doing the same thing that the spacecraft would be doing, uh, controlling the environment, the temperature, the air, um, and protecting you from uh, the vacuum of space and micrometeorites. Uh, it's doing the same thing that the spacecraft is doing. It's just your personal spacecraft. One thing I've always wondered about with a suit is is it designed to be hunched over or is this just happened because of the age of the suit? Um, it is designed to be hunched over and we get a lot of comments here at the Space Center of Houston. People will ask us, you know, why is P. Conrad hunched over? Can you straighten them up? It's designed that way on purpose. It's a matter of it being more uh, ergonomical for the astronaut. It's more comfortable in that shape. Also, when you're in that shape um, in space in the absence of gravity, it also is taking a lot of wear and tear off of your, your shoulders. Um, so part of it is the design of the suit. I also think that another part of that as a display is that there's a lot of hardware in the front, which helps to exaggerate that hunched over look. And there's nothing in the back because there's no backpack back there. So I think it, between those two things is the reason why it's hunched over like that. Great. Well, thank you again for telling us about this amazing suit Great. worn by Pete Conrad, third man on the moon. Thank you. I'm very excited about our next spacesuit that Carmina is going to tell us about. This is one that was used for spacewalks during the shuttle mission. And this is a fascinating type of spacewalk suit. So, Carmina, tell us a little bit about this one. So this is technically called an extravehicular mobility unit, EMU for short. Um, and this is because that's what astronauts wear when they go outside the orbiter, the, the shuttle, uh, to do spacewalks. It's uh, very similar to the Apollo moonwalking suit in that it's a basically a body-shaped spacecraft. It keeps the astronauts alive, comfortable, in communication with mission control, uh, and so that they can stay outside the vehicle for up to eight hours. That is absolutely incredible. So I guess uh, it has to have greater mobility than the moonwalking suit, or is it similar? It's actually similar uh, on the upper torso part. Uh, if you notice, there's uh, a lot of mobility built in. The shoulders have uh, a lot more reach. Um, and if you look carefully, though, the legs don't have a lot of detail. And that's because during a spacewalk, you don't have to move your legs a lot. Most of your mobility is through handholds on the, on the upper torso. So I know that this spacesuit is uh, really extraordinary because it has, you can see the dials on the chest, but it looks like it's all spelt backwards. Why is that? Yes, yeah, so if you can imagine, uh, when you're wearing a spacesuit like this, it's so bulky, it's hard to look down and see anything. So astronauts wear a mirror on their sleeve and they read everything through the mirror. And of course, in the mirror view, it's, it, it's the correct way. Oh, it's a reflection of what's on the chest. And so that it has to be reversed so that you'll see it correctly. So exactly, you're able to read it. yes, that's a great way to put it. And those are all controls for the, um, the inner layers, which control the uh, liquid cooling garment, which helps them uh, keep their temperature consistent. Well, I know when uh, astronauts on the International Space Station do EVAs, they can be out there for hours. How long is a typical spacewalk on a space shuttle? They can last from about six hours. Uh, the longest one has been about eight to nine hours. The suit can, has everything the astronaut needs for eight hours. They can push it to nine hours if they need to. Well, I know when an astronaut's on the International Space Station, 
it's orbiting Earth at 17,500 miles an hour. So they're orbiting Earth every 90 minutes. So they're going into the sun and into the dark. So what are the temperature extremes? Is it similar to the moon? In orbit, the uh, temperature extremes go from about negative 250 to positive 250. So it's a huge temperature range. And that is one of the most important uh, parts of the suit is to regulate the temperature of the astronaut. That's one of the reasons the helmet has a gold cover on it. it. It's a thin layer of actual gold, and it's not only to reflect the sunlight, but also the UV rays that could harm the uh, astronaut's eyes. Well, when an astronaut's doing an EVA, they must be very vulnerable. You've got micrometeorites, you've got radiation from uh, the sun, you've got cosmic radiation. Does the suit provide protection from those dangers of being in space? Absolutely, William. Space uh, is a hostile environment. We um, have dangers out there from micrometeorites. Uh, it's a vacuum of space, so there's, there's no oxygen, there's no air, there's no communications, and so the suit provides everything they need. The suit is more than 14 layers, which includes temperature um, control, radiation protection, and micrometeorite protection. A lot of those layers are to uh, protect the astronaut against micrometeorites. Well, I know it's been successful because we continue to do EVAs on the International Space Station for maintenance. And so has the spacesuit changed over time or is the EVA suit basically the same throughout the, the period of the International Space Station? The suit design has been so successful that it's um, largely stayed the same. There's been a lot of um, innovations in the communications, in the lighting, in the weight, and especially how maneuverable the suit is. If you can imagine wearing a balloon, uh, and once the suit starts being pressurized, it's like you're wearing balloon around your body and it's difficult to move. So there's been a lot of innovations on the inside of the suit to allow the astronauts to move more freely. Absolutely fascinating. So it must require a lot of training. I know we have the Neutral Buoyancy Lab here at NASA Johnson Space Center. So do the astronauts preparing for wearing one in the future train here? And how many hours does it take to get ready to do a spacewalk? Yes, absolutely right. The training happens right here in Houston at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. Believe it or not, for every hour that they're gonna be on a spacewalk, they train up to eight hours in the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. That's that big pool that's right here in Houston where the astronauts train. That's absolutely fascinating. Well, Carmina, thank you so much for telling us about this amazing EMU suit. And you can see it here at Space Center Houston. Now we're going to step back in time and see one of the prototype Apollo hard suits called the RX-5A. I love this. This looks like something out of science fiction. So, Paul, tell us a little bit about this prototype suit and who actually wore it. No one actually wore this one in space. It was worn a lot in training and during the development of this particular prototype. So go back to the early 1960s. NASA needs to design a spacesuit which would be on, used on, on the moon. So NASA had the idea that the spacesuit would be rigid or hard shelled. So think of it, it's, it's kind of like a, um, a knight in, in armor in a way. Um, NASA thought that's what was necessary to be on, on the moon. And they did a lot of prototypes. And this happens to be RX-5, RX-5A. R stands for rigid and X is for experimental. So it's a prototype. And today we've been talking a lot about spacesuits that are used inside spacecraft and, on, and those on the outside. This one's un unique in that it's a, a prototype. So NASA, as I said, is looking to design a lunar suit. This one ended up not being used because it was so heavy um, and very bulky. And inside the Apollo command module, they didn't have a lot of room and weight was everything back then. They had to re remain under a certain amount of weight. So for those reasons, it was not used to go to the moon. But uh, being a prototype, NASA learned a lot from it, which helped the development of the future suits. Well, I imagine too, you'd have to be a certain body size or type to fit in this when you have a rigid suit. I think the later suits that we'll see, or we've seen, actually are fabric, right? So it ena enab enables a greater types of bodies to actually fit and be used in those suits. Yes, and some of those other suits, and especially in the early days of Apollo, the suits were tailored to the individual astronaut. So you and I might not be able to wear the same suit. 
if I was taller or you were taller, it wasn't going to work out. Later on, they adapted and they were able to swap out parts of suits and kind of customize it in that way. In this case, that would be of the hard shell, that would be one of the drawbacks is that people of varying sizes wouldn't be able to use the, be able to use the same, same suit. But there were a lot of uh, good things about the suit. One was the, um, this uh, a hard shell suit, it is a, uh, a full pressure suit, by the way. Um, so it is pressurized on the inside. The greatest advantage of it is it offers a lot of more mobility. So it's easier for the astronauts to move around in. And you'll hear us talk about being in a pressure suit is a lot like being inside of a, a balloon. And once you are pressurized, your arms become stiff and your fingers are really stiff too and they're hard to move. Inside the pressure suit, a lot of that um, balloon part is, that is a hard shell. That's help holding the pressure in and you are not fighting against that pressure bladder or that pressure balloon because of the hard shell and especially it's the joints that's what's helping you. So it takes a lot of the wear and tear off of uh, your work of having to move your elbows and move your waist and your torso around because it has those rigid uh, bearings and joints. So that's the big difference. So interesting, it's fascinating to look at how uh, prototypes are created and tested, and we're so thankful to the astronauts who come before, who are essentially helping us advance this technology. Yes. Uh, I also noticed that it has a very interesting helmet that looks like it provides greater visibility than some of the, the later helmets. And, it look, and I think in the future designs, we're kind of going back to that similar design. That's a, a, a cool thing that when you look at something like the RX-5, it, it looks like something from a science fiction movie, something old but uh, it was kind of ahead of its time. And a lot of the technology and a lot of things that NASA learned from this, they continue to use later on in the uh, shuttle program, such as the, uh, like the hard shell around the torso that was used in the, the shuttle uh, EVA suits. You'll also see the, uh, sometimes it's not always about the material or technology, it's simple things like you pointed out the shape of the helmet, you see how it's kind of canted forward. That is because in the suit, it's hard to bend over and having the helmet shaped that way, especially the visor, it gives the astronaut a better uh, field of view, better visibility of seeing what's in front of his or her self. Fascinating. Well, Paul, thank you for so much about telling us about this amazing historical suit and what it still teaches us for human space exploration. Yes, thank you very much. I'm thrilled that we're now joined by David Graciosi. David is an ILC Dover Fellow located at the Houston Operation. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering and a minor in Mathematics from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, and has more than 30 years of experience in the development of spacesuits and spacesuit components, including shuttle EMU enhancements, Phase VI EVA spacesuit gloves, Mark III suit enhancements, all versions of the I-suit Advanced Planetary EVA suits, several recent launch and entry spacesuits, Stratex space dive suit, NASA Z1 and Z2 spacesuits, and the ILC Dover commercial EVA spacesuit Astro. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> David, a warm welcome to you, and thank you so much for being here. We're so excited to, to have a conversation with you about what we're developing for the future. And I'm really excited that we have actually a prototype here that we have on exhibit at Space Center Houston that looks at um, the upper torso and also what's being developed for the life support backpack by Collins Aerospace. These components of the spacesuit are being tested at this time. So I'm wondering if you could give us some background on this particular suit. Absolutely, the Astro spacesuit uh, that's behind me is a prototype along with a prototype portable life support system. It's really the combination of decades of research in spacesuits. You listed a lot of the ones that we've worked on. This particular version is a rear entry version, so you enter and exit the spacesuit from the rear of the upper torso. We also have a version of this in our lab here in Houston that is waist entry, which is similar to what you see in the EMU spacesuit that's currently up on the International Space Station. So two different types of upper torsos. Can I ask you, what's the advantage of entering from the back as opposed to pulling it up over your legs and over your head? 
So, so the real uh, need for a rear entry system is uh, there is ease in getting in and out of it, um, but, but both upper torsos provide that to some level. It's really the need for this is what's called suit port. And so NASA has looked for many years, actually decades, at suit port. And that really is instead of an airlock that the two crew members or three crew members get in and, and get ready and exit out the vehicle, the suits are the airlock. So they are mounted outside and it minimizes how much loss of gas and other consumables by basically only having to lose the volume of gas or trans tr turn over the volume of gas in the suit itself. So for that, you are, are plugged into the vehicle from behind and you enter the suit. So the suit has to be rear entry architecturally for that. And so that's why we've actually made both versions. So waist entry, lighter, uh, a little more conformal, uh, but rear entry, if NASA in later missions wants to use that, we have to be ready to, uh, to provide that as well. Well, I know we were looking at one of the Apollo spacesuits, and there was actually regolith on it. Wow. And I know that was an issue for the Apollo program because the astronauts would do their walking on the surface of the moon, then get back into the vehicle, and they would bring in the regolith. And we know that it's not a good thing to be breathing regolith or to have it inside the components of the capsule. So I imagine that helps avoid that risk. Right, exactly, and it just keeps everything outside. Yes, there would be times of maintenance, and that's, there's different ways it can be looked at how that's addressed, but yeah, that's one of the biggies is keeping all of that outside. What are some of the key characteristics of the suit? I see that the um, helmet actually is much more, allows more visibility, and then it looks as if the arm sockets are much larger. Right, so, so with this architecture, we actually call it our uh, patented hybrid hut architecture. So it sort of brings the best of soft goods, which a lot of spacesuits like Apollo was an all soft suit. And if you look at the EMU spacesuit that's on space station, that has a mix, right? It has a fiberglass upper torso, um, has a lot of hard components, but a lot of soft. So this as an example is a soft upper torso, but with a exoskeleton over it that allows us to rapidly resize. The crew, in fact, on orbit can resize their upper torso. And historically, that's not been something. They pick a medium, they pick a large, they pick an extra large, and that you have what you have. In this, we have a larger side-bearing opening or shoulder-bearing opening. We also have uh, the ability, which you can't see underneath this cover layer, for them to on orbit rapidly resize and change the shape of it so it's a better fit for them. And so logistically, you fit a very broad population in, in our world of just two of these, where for the EMU, there's currently three, there was even five at one point in the, in the program. So trying to minimize that hardware, but fit everybody better. Mm. What are some of the other modifications in this next generation suit compared to the EMU suit or the moonwalking suits from the Apollo era? So for Astro specifically, we are designing it so that it is sort of a do-all spacesuit for EVA missions. So it can do zero gravity EVA, the space station assembly type work and maintenance, uh, but it can, it's also a walking suit. And um, so it has more rotary bearings than the current EMU has, uh, but it still has a lot uh, more mobility top and bottom. And one of the ways that we get there for the upper torso is you don't see the shoulder here, but it has what's called a rolling convolute shoulder. And as I understand it, you guys have talked about the RX series of spacesuits from Lytton. Yes. So those folks really were the pioneers of what's called rolling convolute joints. So it's again is soft structures with a metal, metal exoskeleton or it could be composite materials. And those joints provide really great mobility and low torque at almost any pressure. So we have evolved that over ourselves over many decades and you don't see it here, but that shoulder design is being used in this suit uh, as well. So a lot more upper torso mobility and unlike EMU, now you have lower torso mobility um, that whether you're in portable foot restraints, you can still move around and bend, but if you wanna go walk, you can walk. And the, the last critical piece is keeping it lightweight. So this version, as you see it, if, you, if we had the whole suit together in waist entry form is almost 50 pounds less than the current EMU equivalent. So new materials, new technologies to get mass down, which is important for any mission. So we know that when you're in space, you don't have Earth's atmosphere or gravitational pull to help keep you whole as a human the way we've evolved. What about dealing with the vacuum of space? I know that the older suits had some type of, <coughs> of um, inner lining that, that, that is pressurized. So this suit would have to be pressurized as well. Right, right. So this suit has 
sort of three basic layers, and all, I would say, all spacesuits really need to or do. So the inner layer retains that air, or in this case, we all ultimately run pure oxygen. Then you have a structural fabric layer that is both fabric and in some cases metal bearings and bracketry and exoskeleton. And then your outermost layer is what you see here, right? It's the thermal micrometeor garment, or for, for Artemis or for exploration, they call it the exploration protective garment. Now that itself is your winter jacket and it's made of many layers. And that's what's really keeping you thermally in good shape, right? Not too hot, not too cold, along with the portable life support system, obviously. Um, so it is those layers, a pressure retaining layer, a structural layer, and then your winter jacket, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we know when we go to the moon and Mars, we're not going to have the same atmosphere to protect us. There's the same kind of elements. And we know that radiation is a big issue, right? Cosmic and solar. Um, have there been advances in protecting astronauts in the design of the suit against radiation? So for radiation, there has been a lot of research and um, we have, it would be baked into this ultimately for those missions, right? Not really needed for low Earth orbit. The current ply up that we use, those multi-layers work well for that. Uh, but especially if you look at Mars, right, there's just enough atmospheric pressure that even the ply up changes, right? A little bit more like a winter parka than you'd have for the vacuum of space, right? It's a little bit different environment there. And then for radiation, high hydrogen content materials sort of used throughout the suit to provide radiation barriers. So we've explored a lot of new materials and then having to embed them in the suit, we keep them flexible. That's the challenge. Keep it small, flexible, and light. Well, that's fascinating. That's the first time I've heard about having hydrogen embedded in the fabric of the suit. So is this through nanotechnology or how do you actually do that? So, well, so in its simplest form, you could think water jackets, right? Water has a lot of hydrogen in it, but that's not really practical. Although we've explored the use of water jackets, right? That could be multifunctional. You have a drink bag, you have a liquid cooling garment that's circulating water through 300 feet of tubing. So you do have some level there. So could you make that more expansive, but thinner, and still flexible. So, you know, that's not a new material, right, but a new application of it. Uh, a lot of high density polyethylene based materials that have high hydrogen content. So, yeah, nanotechnologies is another one. There's just materials that are highly loaded uh, with hydrogen to protect from, from radiation. Right? There's oh, that's a lot of absolutely different things. fascinating. So, I have a question about the visor. So, I mean, this is much more exposure, so you have better vis visual range. Are there things built into that to protect from looking directly into the sun? Because again, you don't have the environment to help filter the right. solar rays. And what you're not seeing here, so in this prototype, it has the pressure retaining layer, which is the innermost bubble, and it has this protective bubble on the outside. And, and this would be there for flight. So this outer one is your first line of defense for impacting, whether it's running into space station f structure as you're translating or falling on the ground, on the moon, on the regolith. Uh, but what you don't see is in between those two layers on this design is a, a dual lens sun visor. So when you see the current EMU up on space station, used to be the gold visor. Now, a few decades ago, we switched to silver, right? And so that is a thermal and optical coating uh, that's there to protect the crew members. Even this layer here will get a thermal optical coating as well, a little bit different arrangement. So there is some very uh, high technology vapor deposited coatings that go into the system of the helmet. And, and those, the one coating that goes on this stays there all the time, but the sun visor, obviously, you can put it up and down like a pair of sunglasses. And then there is an outer shell, and that protects you from the top, still allows enough upward visibility. And then it has a center eye shade that is opaque and two rotating side eye shades. So if you had a bad solar event while you're out there, I mean, NASA keeps track of that thing, those kind of things, but mm -hmm. um, you can basically bring all of those shields down to protect your sun visor and all the opaque shields to provide as much protection as possible. So this, you're not seeing all of those elements. So there's a lot more that goes into this helmet than what you're able to see today. Well, that's just fascinating. So I'm curious about the life support pack here. And of course, <coughs> this is the exterior shell. So we, we kind of see it, but we know there are a lot of components inside. And what are some of the advancements that have been made uh, around the life support systems that are part of the yeah. suit? So there's, there's actually a lot in that arena. So um, we know there's been some issue with water in the helmet on EMU and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, that current PLIS that's being flown goes back to the 1970s. It, at its heart, it has a thing called a fan pump separator that's an amazing piece of equipment that is dual function for the air loop and or oxygen loop and for the water loop. But now with that system being aged and different filters possibly clogging up, it's created some problems, right? So the new PLIS, number one, separates those functions out. 
And then it also applies new technology. So where the current EMU Plus uses a sublimator, so that's basically a plate that uh, allows water to pass through it, turns to gas and cools down, and that's how you cool the water that circulates around the liquid cooling garment that keeps the, the astronaut cool. That's been replaced with what's called a space water membrane evaporator. So it's a new system, more compact, lighter weight, and very tolerant of dirt and gunk that gets in there. It doesn't really care as much about the quality of the water, so you're not gonna get it being clogged up and causing the system to fail. Uh, so that's a new thing. Uh, Collins Aerospace has pioneered new CO2 management system they call rapid cyclamine. So it is a rechargeable system that they can do and it allows us to scrub the CO2 that you breathe out, recirculate that oxygen, clean it and put it back in in a much more efficient manner than even it's done today up on the ISS. Um, a lot of use uh, of 3D printed parts. So there's some new components in here that historically uh, would have been machined or otherwise that are being 3D printed and working with NASA to get those qualified because uh, that is much that technology doesn't seem real new to us anymore, but used in life critical applications, it is. Um, so, and the other big thing here is trying to maintain the outer mold line. So you see this on the table, it has a lot more functionality than the current EMU, but packaged in the same volume. So when we're going up to the ISS, we're not having to change airlocks. We're not having to make things, or rearrange things, basically. It will, the system will plug in and the crew wouldn't even you know, know the difference from a mass and volume standpoint. Wow, this is absolutely fascinating, incredible advances. When will we begin to see astronauts using this new life support technology on EMUs? So the, the, current, uh, the current timeline puts us in mid-2026 that we'll be flying this system, so fully certified and flying. Oh, that's really soon. So yeah, it is. It's, it's a very fast-paced program right now. Everybody's working real hard. Um, and so yeah, we have uh, some challenges in front of us, but uh, we don't think there's going to be a problem getting there. It's really fascinating to hear that you're able to actually take the carbon dioxide exhaled by astronauts, recycle that, and make it back into breathable air. Will that extend the, the length of time that someone could be doing an EVA? You could, you could, but this system is still designed for a standard eight hour EVA because that NASA basically believes that's long enough for the crew to be out and get done what they need to do. Um, but, and so you size that system for the eight hours with some margin, right? But the beauty is if you think back, you talked about Apollo, right? And everybody's seen Apollo 13. Those were, you know, lithium hydroxide canisters that have to get tossed when you're done and you put a new one in. So now you're building up all of this trash where the regenerable systems, they do have a, a life limit to them, but you can cycle them and cycle them and, uh, and not have to just keep throwing things away each time you're done in EVA. Absolutely fascinating. Well, David, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing this incredible innovation in the spacesuits. And I have to say, these are basically spaceships on someone's body, right? They that keeps someone are. alive. And all the insights are really interesting. Right. Again, thank you for joining us. I appreciate it, thank you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Space Center Houston's Thought Leader Series presented by UTMB on our spacesuit collection. What a fascinating presentation. My heartfelt thanks to Paul, Carmina, and David for sharing with us information about the evolution of spacesuits and how they're going to evolve into the future. For more information on this topic, follow Space Center Houston on our social media and check out the Space Center Houston blog at spacecenter.org. I look forward to you joining us on a future episode. Thank <music> you.